Sorry, let me just. Can. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the next session. Uh, we sort of kind of ran out of time last week, so I'm going to end off the session that I was doing on back and legs. Uh, we've got a couple more things to do there, and then we're going to go on to the next chapter. So we'll just see how we go along. Um, I'm going to share my screen here and just pick up from where I left off last week. Um, do that and shrink me down. Okay, we're still continuing with uh, your body sign language and we are doing stiffness, which is the loss of flexibility and agility, especially in the arms, legs and back this week. Uh, stiffness can be a sign of a lack of physical fitness, like what I'm suffering from at the moment because I was moving earth over the weekend while trying to sort my pavement out where they've been digging up for fiber and I can't wait for our fiber to be installed. Um, and this is especially true at a young age. So hopefully that means I'm still young. But basically, if, you've, if you haven't been doing any exercise for a while and you suddenly go out and run 5Ks in 20 minutes, you're probably going to feel stuff the next day. So that's comparatively normal. And inflammation is often indicated by stiffness. So the reason for the stiffness after physical exercise is that there's an excess of um, lactic acid in your muscles and that be, makes the muscles less flexible, which makes them feel more stiff. But inflammation um, can also lead to stiffness. A lack of physical fitness also contributes to fatigue a loss of coordination, aches, pains, and sensitivity. Um, and you would be aware of this if you haven't done anything for some significant time, and then all of a sudden you go out and you think you can do a 45 minute gym session, uh, you are not gonna get very far and you will suffer from the fatigue, the loss of coordination, aches, etc. The combination of aerobic and weight bearing exercises are helpful. And by this, we're not talking about going to gym and finding the heaviest weights you can find and see how much you can bench press if you've never done it before. Just start off small, start off light. Uh, start off at the local shopping center and park a little bit further away and walk. That is your aerobic exercise. Weight bearing. Park your trolley in the shopping center and carry your bags to the shops. That is your weight bearing exercise. And that is a start with everything you start small. The guys that win the Comrades Marathon do not wake up that morning and say, oh, I think I'm going to go for a 98K jog. They have been practicing for probably a year or more. In fact, if you go back, you'll most likely find they've been practicing for about five or six years before they get there. According to research, being physically fit is a way of protecting yourself against coronary heart disease, remembering that your heart is a muscle, and in order to get muscles toned, we need to do exercise. Um, and you're also going to protect yourself against hypertension, stroke, type 2 diabetes, obesity, osteoporosis, probably colon cancer, and we'll get into that in the next chapter of the book that I'm going to get to. And along with colon cancers, other cancers as well, because when you are exercising and moving, you're getting everything move, moving the way that we're designed to do. And that way, your body is also able to boost its immune system and protect itself. And you're also going to overcome clinical depression, because when you're exercising, you are releasing what they call dopamines. Um, and this is where people get addicted. You've heard of the addicted to adrenaline or adrenaline. Um, and this is where one overcomes things like clinical depression um, because of that, uh, because the dopamine is released and that helps you to relax. And the thought of running 5Ks, I know, can be quite daunting. But once you're out and walking or running in nature on the road, 
you lose all of your depression because you're getting fresh air, you're getting oxygen into your system, you're getting your muscles and circulation going, and things are working really well. Stiffness may also be caused by allergic responses or intolerance to foods or chemicals, which result in inflammation and fluid retention. So sometimes one's got to look logically when you're getting fit, if you've, uh, when you're getting stiff. If you've been sitting around not doing anything for a while and you go out and you do a small amount of gardening or a little bit of a walk and you get fit, that's probably because of the fact that you're not very fit at the moment. But if you have been de developing fit, uh, uh, stiffness on a daily basis, where there's, you haven't really been doing anything out of the ordinary, you just automatically get stiff, that's time to check it out and see what is causing this, what's, what's leading to your stiffness. Omega-3 oils often provide significant relief from stiffness due to their anti-inflammatory properties. And I must say, I've seen the difference with this. Um, and if you take a couple of omegas before you go out for a run or a cycle or something that's a little bit more than the norm, um, it's very good for what they call DOMS, which is delayed onset muscle stiffness. And because of its anti-inflammatory properties, it works really, really well. And I must say the new magnesium also helps tremendously from this perspective. So some of the suggestions over here, logically avoid allergens. Eat well, again, logic, but not always easy. Exercise regularly. And by this, we mean do something every day. Even if it is just to walk around your house, around the outside, we all know how creative people got during lockdown when we weren't allowed off our properties, basically. And there were people that were running 10, 15 Ks around their house. It was not easy, but it was doable. So one can exercise regularly. And we need to obtain essential nutrients, including the B-complex vitamins, omega-3s, and antioxidants. And most of those you'll get from our pro vitality. Has anybody got any stories about stiffness and how they've overcome it recently? If you can unmute yourself and share. Because I'm not seeing anybody, so... Um, Sean, can I just quickly ask you, uh, yes. what is the meaning of vigility? Oh, no, agility, sorry, what was that word? I can't Ag remember. Now. Agility. Agility, what is agility. the meaning of? It means being able to move quickly and easily. So if oh, you're walking oh, yeah, in a straight yeah, line right, and you, yeah. you see a snake, you Sorry. can jump off easy to one side. Um, climbing a tree, we talk about people being agile. Cl uh, kids climbing yeah, jungle, yeah, jungle gyms yeah. are very agile. That's the agility. Thank you. When you started explaining, I remember. <laughs> I just All want right. to say, we can't, we, can't, mm. we can't go into this in detail now. I have a problem that my legs are, are weak. Uh, if I say weak, um, I do, I do everything that you say about with my diet, with all my supplements, I take a lot. Mm -hmm. I do exercise with my legs, sit-ups and whatever. But um, if I have to get up on a chair, I have to mm -hmm. use my one leg, the other one, uh, I really battle. If I okay. have to get up of a huge deep steps mm -hmm. like and put my, my one uh, uh, leg down, I'm afraid to put the other one. I must touch uh. something. Okay. My my legs, uh, even in the bath, I start showering now. And I love my bath mm -hmm. because I battle to get out of the bath because of my legs that they're not strong. So yeah, I was just wondering. But anyways, okay. uh, we can talk on that. Yes. I, I don't know. <laughs> my let, let, my mother had uh, my mother had calcification of the arteries. My mom. Okay. She had right. painful legs. My legs are not paining. Sometimes on the shin in the front, mm -hmm. and and eventually she couldn't walk. Mm -hmm. because just she wasn't um, paralyzed or whatever. Yes. Her legs were, were weak, but she had uh, calcification of the arteries. That's another okay. topic. Maybe we must Arteriosclerosis. And I was yeah. wondering whether I'm not having calcification of the arteries. 
it's possible. And the best way to get that checked is to um, go and see a physician who can do a floor physical to check it out. Yeah. Yeah. I was considering this for the last few years, but I just do a lot of exercise for my yeah. legs, but it's not really important. So maybe it's that. Okay, I won't talk anymore. No more, no problem. Yeah. All right, let's go on to the next one. Uh, George, can so I just we... ask you something? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Yeah, okay, go. go, Dominique. No, no, I was just going to say, um, after walking and running, uh, the stiff, stiffness is sometimes there, worse than mm. others, different, depends on the distance and whatever, in some days. Uh, and like you know, the for people who don't know, the... Uh, shake is absolutely fabulous for recovery either if I, I, I notice the days that I, I the odd times where i don't put a shake, i don't take a shake before or even after if i don't take before I, if i remember to take after either way it helps recovery it's something absolutely amazing yeah so That's anybody good. doing long runs and comrades and all that are serious runners or i tell you what that shake is brilliant the sports yeah. performance shake is also very good oh is it okay all right i'll use that Okay, I see you yeah. wanting to ask. Um, I wanted to ask uh, many years ago, um, when I got my mom's prescript medicine from the pharmacy, a gentleman came in and pushed his wife in a, in a wheelchair, but she was a short lady, but both her legs were straight. It wasn't bent down like if you're in a mm -hmm. wheelchair. Will yes. that be something like what you're talking about? There's a few reasons for that. It could be very much related to the stiffness. Um, could have been that uh, there's a possibility that her knees had been fused surgically for various reasons. This does happen. Um, it's a very uncomfortable situation to be in and very, very awkward. But yes, it could be part of these things that I've just been covering over here. Thank you very much. No problem. Right, let's go on to the next one. And that is varicose veins, or as I often say to my patients, very cross veins. And these are swollen, inflamed, and irritated veins. And this is the sort of thing that I see in my practice on a very regular basis. Um, people come to see me for compression stockings to help with veins. And these pictures that I've got over here are comparatively mild to some cases that I've seen. They can be quite, quite nasty. Varicose veins are unsightly, for one thing, but they can also lead to deadly blood clots. The reason for this is that when blood stops moving or slows down, it clots. That's just how it works, because if you've got a cut, you want your blood to clot, because otherwise you will leak out and lead to death. Um, so with a varicose vein, if that it does definitely affect the circulation and your blood slows down or can block up, and that is where the blood clots come from. With every heartbeat, your blood needs to circulate from your heart to your head, to your foot, and back again in a pulse beat. Check your wrist and see how many times that's happening every minute. Valves in the vein, allow blood to flow in one direction only. So I normally do a little trick on my hand that I show people, but I don't have time to do that tonight. But you can test it on your hands if you've got a good set of veins. You can see exactly pushing down in the vein, run your finger along, and you'll see how the vein collapses and then comes back again. And that's where the valves are. Constipation and straining at the stool cause high pressure in your body, which causes damage to the valves and the veins. And it can sound quite strange when you see somebody with varicose veins and you say, well, how's your um, regularity in your bowel? Are you going to the toilet regularly or not? Because that could be causing your vein problems in your legs. And in the next chapter, I will show you exactly how this works. Lack of exercise and poor muscle tone interfere with the functioning of the muscle pump and contribute to varicose veins. And I often demonstrate this to my patients as well, saying that when you are up and about moving, your leg muscles are acting as pumps. And um, if, you're, if you're not moving or walking, your pumps are not operating the way that they're supposed to pump. 
which leaves us with a problem. And if you've got a, a rain tank, for instance, and you work on a gravity feed, if your tank is lower than your house, you're never going to get any water out of it. If it's higher, you will get water. If you attach a pump to it, you'll get water at a much better pressure. And our bodies work on a very similar system. Physically active people in the world on a high roughage diet have only a one to a one in a thousand case of varicose veins. Um, the incidence in the USA is closer to one to 10. Because, and again, I'll cover this in the next chapter, the Western diet, or the, they call it the sad diet, the standard American diet, has virtually no roughage or fiber in it, which leads to all sorts of problems. And this is why and why I found this book to be so fascinating, because specifically the last couple of chapters, these are conditions I see physically in my office virtually every week. And so many of them are diet related. And in fact, I've started referring quite a few of my patients to the dietitian that happens to be in my office or in the same office complex as me. She also happens to be a downline. So I have ulterior motives there sometimes, but not always. It's more to actually sort the patients out and get them to overcome their problems without medication. Varicose veins greatly increase the risk of blood clots. Um, other words for these are phlebitis. Uh, there's another big fancy term called thrombophlebitis, which thrombo meaning clot and phlebitis. Any, remember anything that, that says itis is inflammation. Um, and for those of you who have ever been in hospital or ever had to have your blood taken, the person taking your blood is technically known as a phlebotomist or as we call them, uh, other mosquitoes, or um, yeah, <laughs> along those lines. <laughs> and um, the other thing is an embolism. An embolism is a clot, and that can be in the form of a blood clot or an air embolism, which is an air clot, essentially, but most people have blood clots. I do, and I fit compression stockings on a virtually daily basis. This is not only for, like this picture, your varicose veins, but also a flit, a fit compression stockings to people who have had surgery or are having surgery in hospital, because if they're undergoing surgery and they're not going to be moving around very much for a while, like they've had a hip or a knee replacement, or my ladies who have um, cesarean sections, or even an appendectomy where you have your appendix removed or any of those, any big cardiac conditions, that sort of thing, you're lying in bed and you're not moving around very much. Plus you have a whole lot of drugs and stuff floating through your system and the risk for developing blood clots is very high. And this is where I kick in and I go and fit compression stockings to help to increase the pressure in the legs to speed up the blood supply. An adequate fiber intake and regular exercise reduce the risk of a potentially fatal barrage of blood clots to the lungs. And this is why it is so very important at this current stage, because with COVID, COVID has been causing a huge number of blood clots. And that is a lot of what's been killing people is the blood clots or the embolism um, more than the virus itself. And they still haven't figured out what is really causing the extra clotting, but COVID is known as a clotting disease, virus, call it what you will. And this is where there's been a lot of problems. We're seeing clots in the lungs, which then can float around and lodge in the brain or the heart. And uh, I won't go into exactly what results out of those things. So this is where we can see how diet is so important and a broad spectrum diet, specifically fiber. Fiber is so, so underutilized in my opinion. Um, for a diabetic, fiber is vital. Um, I think the 
the, the um, rate of fiber that we should be getting is around about 28 grams of fiber per day. Most of us are not getting anything close to that. And a diabetic will need anything up to about 32 grams of fiber per day. So fiber is vital. So the suggestions, consume adequate fiber in foods or supplement form daily. Fiber is found in a lot of foods and it's not found in a lot of processed foods. And this is where the danger comes in. Again, I mentioned the standard American diet, which sadly most South Africans follow as well, is junk food. Any processed food has most of the fiber removed together with most of the vitamins and minerals. All of that has been removed and we're left with the starch and the sugars. That is where the problems come in. So people who are eating a lot of KFC and similar types of foods, McDonald's, all those sort of things are not getting any fiber in their system and they're literally killing themselves slowly. We've got two sources of fiber in our supplement range. We've got the multi-fiber blend and that is quite a user-friendly powder because you can make gravy out of it, you can add it to your shake. And just by the way, our shake has got quite a large amount of fiber in it. I think it's between five to eight grams of fiber in it. Um, you can, if you're making your own bread, you can add the, the fiber blend into there and make bread with it. You can add it to porridge, to pretty much anything. Um, muffins, all those sort of things you can use the fiber blend with. Whereas the fiber tablets, um, I think contain slightly less fiber, uh, but in so, some people don't want the, the powder, some people prefer the tablets. It really, we've got the option to give to people. And we shouldn't stand or sit without moving for long periods of time. So office workers um, are big problems. And what I often suggest to people when I do see them, when they come into my office for stockings and things like that, I say, if you're spending time behind a computer, please set a timer on your system, on your watch, on your phone, on your whatever, that every 30 to 45 minutes, get up, stretch, move around, take a jog around your table, drink some water, get your blood supply moving, and then come back and go on. because sitting for extended periods of time can cause major, major problems. And this is what also what happens when flying, specifically overseas. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of economy class syndrome, and that is where people develop blood clots um, on these long distance international flights. And often people will wear what's known as flight socks, which are compression stockings. And when flying and a simple flight from Durban to Joburg isn't much of an, of an issue, but flying from Durban to Cape Town could be, or Joburg to Cape Town could be because of uh, it's about a two hour flight. And remembering though, when you're flying from Durban to Joburg, you're flying to a massive elevation up there. So it's a change in air pressure. When you're flying, you're sitting in a cramped seat for an extended period of time. You're being dehydrated by the um, air conditioning in the aircraft, you're probably not drinking sufficient fluids, you're definitely not moving around much, and you've got the artificial cabin pressure that's also causing a problem on your system, and that is where you end up with your economy class syndrome. So if you're gonna be flying, please look into getting yourself a set of flight socks before you go. And we need to exercise to maintain proper muscle tone. You've seen what happens if you don't exercise, you get all, your muscles get all flabby very quickly, but if you do exercise and tone up, they come back very quickly. And so good muscle tone is very, very important. And then we need to supplement with vitamin C and or flavonoids, because vitamin C and flavonoids help to create collagen, which helps to give the elasticity, not only to vein walls and artery walls, but also to bones. Fish oils are your anti-inflammatories and help to get the circulation going a little bit better, as is vitamin E, which also makes your platelets less sticky and less prone to clotting. Um, and in my opinion, I think the flavonoids probably work better for varicose veins than just the C on its own. 
and then obviously the salmon oil and our vitamin E, which has the full spectrum of eight vitamin E's in it. And now we've got the weakness in the legs. This, this is one I was actually going to skip, but I'm quite glad I didn't skip it. Um, this, is, this comes from vitamin B1 deficiency. And the legs can become weak due to a deficiency of vitamin B1 or D. Linda, I don't know if this is an underlying issue in you, but it might be something to look at. No, no, okay. no, not at all. All right. Deficiency of thiamine, which is what vitamin B1 is, may be indicated if the calf muscle is tender when squeezed. And you know, sometimes people wake up in the middle of the night with a calf cramp, or they've been sitting for a while and you develop that tenderness in the calf. Could be your vitamin B1 levels that are low. Very, very begins with weakness and feeling loss in the legs. So you get your, these heavy legs. And this is followed by swelling of the lower half of the body and can lead to heart failure and death. And this was very common in the um, prison camps, prisoner of war camps in World War II, because they were feeding the prisoners um, processed rice or, or white rice. And the prisoners were developing very, very. And there were, one of the prisoners was a doctor who managed to bribe the, the guards and got some of the um, outer casings of the rice after it had been washed. And by giving that to the prisoners, that was obviously a good source of vitamin B1, and the very, very problems were reversed. And that's where a lot of the research started over there. Um, the loss of B1 after the introduction of white rice in the Orient cost many lives. So when they started processing rice and polishing it, the B1 was flushed out. And this is why white rice is so bad for one, because what you're getting is starch with none of the nutrients. And technically, sugar is a similar thing, because sugar cane is very healthy. Once they've processed out all the good stuff, we left with the white crystalline stuff, which is poison. Pretty much the same with rice. They polish off the bran and the, and the roughage and all the rest of it, and we left with starch. So I know my family doesn't always like it, but if I go shopping, I will always buy brown rice. Those who ate unrefined rice protected themselves from a horrible death from beriberi, because beriberi is a, it kills you slowly. Sort of like the whole Western diet at the moment, I think. The elderly often develop weak legs due to a vitamin D deficiency. And I think often it's because not only do we not absorb nutrients quite as effectively as we get older, but often elderly don't spend as much time outside in fresh air and sunlight. So they're losing out on the vitamin D over there. Senior citizens supplemented with 800 IUs of vitamin D and calcium had half the number of falls of those who just received calcium. And I found that quite interesting. So that is where I think our calcium, our calcium magnesium is a really, really good supplement because we've got the calcium, we've got the magnesium, and we've got the vitamin D all together. Plus it's chelated, so you're absorbing about 80% of that. And most of these supplements are not going to be received by elderly people or people in general. Suggestions, supplement with calcium, magnesium, obviously with the vitamin D involved. The B complex, remembering that we can't just take a B1 or a B12 or a B2, because that can overload the, the B receptors, and then your body won't be able to process the other things. And as we've seen in previous talks, often the B vitamins work together. So B1 will work with B3 and B2 will work with B6 and B6 will work with B12. So it's always good to have a B complex so that your body can figure out what it needs when it needs it. And the cod liver oil in this country is marketed as vitamin A and D, so it is another good source of vitamin D. Um, and if you want to go skateboarding in your 70s or 80s, take your vitamin Bs. 
And that is the end of that session on back and legs. And I see I've only got six minutes left. So I'm actually, I'm not gonna go into the next session tonight. I will keep that for next week. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Does anybody have any testimonies on varicose veins, maybe um, stiff legs, leg cramps? Linda, go for it. Okay, a quickie, uh, interesting. I'm not quite sure. Okay, a downline of a team member many years ago, we were still working together at the same place. And she had a customer who bought um, Calmac mm -hmm. from her, obviously for the bone story, you know, we were very much into always the Calmac, especially me. <laughs> and this woman testified that uh, she had varicose veins and she said it was painful varicose veins. I'm not sure if it's always painful, but that is they're, what this lady said. They're quite often painful, yes. That since she was taking the Calmac, it helped so much for the pain for the varicose veins and she mm -hmm. regularly took it from an ita i don't know that years ago what happened after that mm -hmm. and i think maybe it's just because the walls of the veins are stronger correct uh, yeah but but this is what happened so this is mm -hmm. my little quick testimony that's brilliant that. thank you and i must say i've got a downline as well um she's not in this call tonight but um apart from many other issues one of the things is that she's also, uh, apart from arthritis, she's suffered from varicose veins. And I suggested she started the flavonoids because I know she's been taking the omega-3 for the arthritis. And once she started on flavonoids, her varicose veins have improved dramatically. They are still mm. there to a certain extent, but they're not nearly anything more of a problem any more than is what they used to be. And I've seen the difference. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's excellent. That's wonderful. Sean, if I may oh. ask, why will the veins be painful? Is that because of the pumping of the blood? Not circulating of, properly? That's one of the reasons. And often they will become inflamed as well. Um, and that's where your phlebitis comes from. But the questions that I'll ask my patients is, is there an itching feeling, which often is there? Do you uh, feel cramps, which often is there? And the pain is normally um, where there is cramping or there's, it's like a dull ache in the vein itself. And the other scary th thing that often happens is you've got the varicose veins, um, you're a diabetic, and now your leg gets warm and wet, so you've had a very hot bath or a very hot shower, and you simply brush against the vein or you accidentally knock it against a bed or something like that, and that vein pops and you develop what's known as a varicose ulcer. Those things are a living nightmare to try and fix. And I've seen cases where a varicose ulcer has ultimately led to a person losing their leg through amputation, mm. because of gangrene. Um, now, once they're on the vitamin C and all the flavonoids and using compression stockings, we've got special compression stockings for that, they heal up quite dramatically and quite often in a very short space of time. I, I wonder... Hmm? Sorry, Not with the Okay, no, <laughs> no, I was just wondering, picking up on what I've said about the calcium and mm -hmm. your question, Ansi, if the veins are, the varicose veins are really big and the, the walls of the artery stretch, yes. uh, of the vein stretch, and that could also maybe cause the pain. Correct. And the calcium made those stronger. And I don't know, yeah, but maybe all of that, it just it's makes sense to me. But that, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, we've got two minutes left. Anybody else? Sean, yes. Sean, do you put spider veins in the same, spider veins count as the same same block as uh, the same veins? thing as, as varicose veins or not as much? Technically, <clears throat> yes, but it's uh, on a much, much lower scale. Um, yeah. and you normally find them around the foot and ankle area. Again, if they, if they burst and, they, and they develop an ulcer, that can be quite mm. dangerous, but in most cases, your spider veins are not as big of an issue as mm -hmm. uh, a varicose vein, which I've seen them as thick as my thumb. And they're just these... Uh, uh, a very, no, a varicose vein. 
But a spider 100%. vein is generally yes, exactly it's, that. It's just a very, it's a very thin, small little vein. Yeah. Why, why does that appear on, on your skin? And see, you wanted to say something, and we Sorry, were talking at the this, same time. This, I just wanted to know, I'll leave that other yeah. one. Um, what caused the spider veins? Again, it's, oh, it it's um, there's a couple of different reasons, but a lot of it, age is one of them, which we can't obviously help. But it's the lack of exercise. It's um, the also a, a decrease in the amount of vitamin C in the system. Um, but it's a, they caused more or less the same way as uh, varicose vein. And unfortunately, I think that is the end of where we're going to because it's about to bomb out. So thanks, everybody. And thank you very much. Appreciate it. Next Tuesday. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Thank, thank you, Sean. 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 Sean.